the National Rifle League 22 October Course of Fire. This week on Mail Call Mondays. The Mail Call Mondays is brought to you by Modular Driven Technologies. If you need a chassis system for your precision rifle, check out mdttac.com. I'm John McQuay with 8541 Tactical, and this is Mail Call Mondays, the show that answers your questions about precision rifles, optics, and equipment. Welcome to another Mail Call Mondays, and this last weekend I shot the National Rifle League 22 local club match uh, here at the Westside Sportsman's Club in Evansville, Indiana. And uh, so today we are going to talk about that course of fire. Now we had a really rainy match, but thankfully Westside Sportsman's Club on their 100-yard bay, uh, they have a nice um, awning covering the, the whole firing line. Uh, so we were able to stay undercover for most of the match. Uh, we kind of moved things around a little bit so that we weren't uh, directly in the pouring rain for most of it. Uh, however, some of the stages, uh, like the tank trap stage, uh, we really didn't have the room to set up the tank trap uh, underneath the cover. So uh, we did get out, we did get wet, and sometimes the rain was coming in a little bit sideways. So uh, we're going to talk about the course of fire, and then we're going to talk about equipment as well. So I did shoot the rig here in front of me, the Tika T1X, in the Modular Driven Technologies ACC chassis. Uh, and we'll talk about some gear considerations for shooting in the rain, especially with the 22s here in a little bit. So this is the October Course of Fire, and as usual, you can find the printout of the uh, whole Course of Fire on the National Rifle League 22 website at nrl22.org. Uh, we shot these close to the normal order with the exception of we saved the paper stage to the absolute last. Uh, we were hoping to get a little bit of a hole in the weather that we could throw the paper stage out and shoot it without the target melting off of the board. Uh, but that didn't happen, so uh, we did actually get the targets a little bit soaked for that. The first stage uh, for this month's Course of Fire was Tank Trap Terror. Uh, Tank Trap Terror is a 10-round uh, stage, as are all NRL 22 stages, and a 120-second time limit again, which all these stages had a 120-second time limit. The targets and ranges were 50 yards, a 6-inch single hanger, a 75-yard, 2.5-inch single hanger, and at 100 yards, a 3-inch single hanger. Uh, points were 10 points per impact, 100 points possible, and equipment is one bag that is approximately the size of a volleyball or smaller, and a sling. Um, so the the bag that I used for this was uh, the WeBad Mini Fortune Cookie. I decided that this was going to be my one and only bag that I was going to use for the entire match this month uh, to see how well it works. And uh, because we're starting to get into a little bit of a gear race here in the NRL 22 matches, and again, we'll talk about that here closer to the end of the episode. So, the course of fire, the starting position was port arms, mag in, and bolt back. On the command to start, shooter will engage the 50-yard target with two shots from the unsupported standing position. Shooter will then engage the 75 and 100-yard target with one round each from the three tips of the tank trap. Shooter will then engage the 50-yard target with two rounds from the kneeling position. Uh, so... Uh, this was an interesting course of fire because it mixed a variety of different things in uh, the, the whole one course of fire. So you had to start off uh, with an unsupported position. Uh, then you had to move to the tank trap, which we consider tank trap a barricade type position. Um, you had to shoot off of that. You had to deal with varying distances. So we have 50, 75, and 100 yards. So you had to decide if you were going to dial or if you're going to hold uh, for your various distances. And then finally, we had the kneeling position. Uh, now, normally, anytime we shoot unsupported, I will use a sling. 
Uh, but because of the tank trap and because of the way we we're going to move, I didn't want to waste time getting into and out of the sling. If it's an unsupported position or an unsupported stage where I'm going to stay in uh, the sling for the whole stage, then I'll go ahead and use the sling because then I can get it uh, set during my prep time. Uh, and then moving between standing, kneeling, seated, prone, etc., with the sling already on your body is not that big of a deal. Uh, things like the Tab Gear uh, PRS sling allow you to adjust, loosen, and tighten up the sling while you're in it. Uh, so you can move around like that. But in this instance, I knew that I was going to use a totally different position on the tank trap than I would use slung. So I didn't want to be in the sling, have to come out of it, uh, get on the tank trap, and then move around the tank trap and worry about possibly hanging up the sling on uh, one of the, the different arms of the tank trap. So I went with no sling on this. Um, the ACC chassis, the way I've got it balanced out now, makes it very easy to shoot offhand uh, with no sling because it balances right in this area here, uh, depending on if I have the um, bipod on or off. Uh, so really easy to get in there. And a six inch target at 50 yards uh, is not horrible for offhand. So went ahead, took my two shots offhand, and then moved over onto the tank trap. And I used the mini fortune cookie on the ends, on the tips of the tank trap. Uh, and it was very stable. I was able to drop the bag on there, get the rifle uh, stable on top of it, balanced out really nicely, uh, and able to get my hits. Now, I did hold for everything. I kept my turrets zeroed out at 50. And then I used uh, uh, one mil holdover for 75 and a two mil holdover for 100 um, and was able to get through and get my hits pretty quickly. That allowed me to move fast from one position to the next uh, and not have to worry about coming up here and dialing elevation. Now, I did have to adjust my parallax because uh, there's a significant enough difference from 50 to 100 uh, that if you try to run at the same parallax setting, your target is very blurry uh, and you have the ability to induce parallax and cause what would be a hit, a miss, just because of misalignment behind the scope. Uh, so it is important that if you decide to dial or if you decide to hold to still remember, you're going to need to adjust that parallax. Uh, so that led into my reasoning for not dialing elevation, uh, but just worrying about dialing the parallax to get where I needed. Uh, then I moved over and dropped into the kneeling position. Um, it took me a minute to get into the kneeling position that I wanted. Uh, I haven't been practicing kneeling, and my kneeling is almost a sitting. Uh, so when I kneel, uh, I'm flexible enough that I can get down and I actually sit on my heel. Uh, so I've got my, kneel and my knee and my ankle on the ground, uh, and then I will kick out my support side leg and then uh, brace my arm on the inside of my support side leg. Uh, and that works very well. It works better when I'm slung up, uh, but it works just fine with no sling at all. So that's what works for me. But the big thing with kneeling is you have to find the position that works for you. But with kneeling, lower is more stable. So the lower you can get, the better. Uh, being up on your knee and uh, either sitting on your heel with your foot directly down uh, or totally up on your knees to where your butt is not even on your foot, uh, those are really not that stable a position. Uh, it's better to get low as you can, uh, even down to the point where you are sitting on your ankle or sitting on your foot. That is my preference. But um, I've been getting into that for a while. Again, I'm still fairly flexible, especially for my age, uh, so I'm able to get into those low kneeling positions fairly quickly and fairly easily. Uh, overall, I didn't do too terrible on this stage. I dropped uh, one shot. I don't recall exactly where I dropped the shot because, again, I was uh, racing to get set and I didn't actually shoot any footage of me uh, shooting that stage. I did get some footage of uh, Neil Burnett shooting the stage, uh, and he did great. Uh, Neil... Uh, is the match director for our local club matches, and he keeps me on my toes. If I slip just a little bit, 
then he will get me as far as the, the overall match. So it's great to go back and forth on uh, which one of us takes the win uh, for the match. But um, that was the first stage. Uh, now, as I said, the second stage was the paper stage, but we saved that one for last. So I'm going to skip that one for now, and we will go to stage two, which was prone pandemonium. This is a very interesting stage. So uh, ranges and targets are 100 yards, a 2-inch and a 5-inch target, and a double hanger. Uh, the points were 10 points per impact, 100 points possible, and equipment was one bag that is approximately the size of a volleyball or smaller. So the description says supported prone means bipod and rear bag. Unsupported prone means sling only like we always do. Um, on start, shooter will go supported prone and engage the two inch target with two rounds. Shooter will then go to unsupported prone and engage the five inch target with two rounds. Back to supported on the two inch with two rounds, back to unsupported on the five inch for two rounds, back to supported on the two inch for two rounds. Uh, so we're starting supported, so bipod, rear bag, rear bag if you wish, you didn't have to use a rear bag, but it's recommended. Um, on start, drop down behind the rifle, load the magazine, chamber up around, uh, fire two shots at the smaller target, the two inch target at 100 yards. Uh, then you would lift the rifle up so the bipod was no longer on the ground and the rear was no longer on your bag and you would fire two shots at the five inch target at 100 yards. You'd then set the rifle back down and shoot two shots at the smaller of the two targets. And you go back and forth, back and forth until you were done. So really not a difficult stage because you were allowed to bag the rifle in. So get it on target, get everything set up before you stood up behind the rifle uh, on the start signal, slide in behind the rifle and you should be right there. So those first two shots should be a gimme. I say should be because I missed my first two shots. Um, there was something strange going on and I haven't gone back and checked it out, but I was very consistent high and left off the target. And I tried to shift and get back on it and I dropped it low and right. Uh, so something weird going on. I don't know if it was due to the rain. Uh, usually rain does not have much of a ballistic effect. It has more of an effect on shooter and on equipment, uh, but it was just strange for this stage. So I was missing shots that I should not have missed at all. And I had no problems on the hundred yard target on the stage before. Uh, so Again, something weird going on there. But then after you fired your first two shots, um, then you came up off of the bipod and off of the rear bag and fired your shots there. Now here, the key was getting that arm underneath the fore end of the rifle. Now again, you could have shot with a sling if you wanted to. So you could have had uh, your sling on the rifle and taken the time to sling up and come up. Uh, but that is not what I wanted to do. I didn't want to have to mess with the sling back and forth. And prone without a sling is not that big of a deal because you can get your elbows onto the mat and they generally don't slide around much. So you can get underneath the rifle and uh, get it fairly stable fairly quickly. Um, I did actually get a shot or two uh, to hit unsupported, uh, but it wasn't the greatest uh, stage for me at all. Uh, one of the things you want to consider with this is if you use a sling, then you're probably not going to use a rear bag. Uh, because if you're using a sling, that front arm, that support side arm is going to be locked up in that sling and it's going to be difficult if you have the sling tight enough to do its job. When you come back down on the bipod, it's going to be difficult to get that arm back to be able to adjust your rear bag and get your elevation dialed in. Uh, so that back and forth and back and forth would be a pain. Now you could come out of the sling and come back, but I think going back into it, you're gonna take too much time slinging back up. Whereas without it, it's a simple matter just to swing that arm forward, pick the rifle up, fire your two shots, bring the rifle back down and go back to the rear. Um, should have been a very easy stage. Um, there, I'm not sure what was going on, uh, I'm going to have to take another rainy day and I'm going to have to take this rig out and shoot it for groups on paper at 100 uh, just to see if when I get the rifle soaked out 
um, if I start to get any point of impact shift again. Uh, that was the problem, is that after that first stage, uh, the rifle was soaked. Uh, so I did have water all through it, down into the bedding, um, etc. Uh, one thing that I was considering is, I don't know if um, the water was getting into the bore and having any effect on that um, first couple of inches of uh, barrel inside the muzzle. Uh, so that is definitely something that I'm going to have to check. I may go out to the range uh, with a water bottle and uh, a sprayer on a clear day and spray down the rifle and see if I get a change. And then shoot it again when I actually have rain coming down and see if I get a change. With high velocity rifles, the rain generally does not have an effect on the ballistics of the actual bullet itself. It has more of an effect on the equipment and on the shooter. Um, however, I really, I'm not bashful in saying I don't have enough experience shooting 22 caliber rifles in the rain to know if the slower, lighter weight bullet um, is affected at all by the actual precipitation coming down in the air. Uh, obviously, it can be affected, again, by the rifle being wet, uh, getting water inside the chamber, getting water in the bolt, that kind of thing. Uh, but I'm not sure of the actual ballistic effects. I'm going to have to go out and test that a little bit more uh, just to see if uh, we're getting any issues uh, with the rain interacting with the bullet itself. So uh, something interesting, uh, I just want to know, uh, what are your guys' uh, experience shooting in the rain? So uh, drop that down below, specifically shooting rim fires in the rain. So total, I got uh, three hits on that stage, which uh, was pretty disappointing for me. Uh, again, I, I was breaking good shots. They felt good, uh, but then I would clearly see the impact off the target. Um, now, when I say clearly see, I would see the brush move behind the target, so I knew the quadrant that I missed on, uh, but I had trouble actually uh, seeing was it just a tiny bit off the plate or was it significantly off the plate to get a good offset. Uh, we have quite a bit of weeds and brush behind our targets at the 100 yard line, uh, so it is difficult on rainy days when you can't see any trace or see any dirt kick uh, to figure out exactly where that bullet went to. The next stage was a prone stage, and it was five gallons of gore. Uh, so this one was kind of interesting because um, it wasn't strictly a prone stage. I, uh, again, kind of combined some different things. Each one of the stages through this combined some different positions, and it was uh, pretty enjoyable. So uh, the ranges and targets for this stage were 35 yards on a 1-inch and a 0.75-inch on a KYL rack. Then we had 100 yards, a 2-inch, and a 2.5-inch on a double hanger. Again, 10 points per impact, 100 points possible, and equipment is one bag that's the size of a volleyball or smaller, like a wee bad mini fortune cookie. The start position was the rifle resting on a 5-gallon bucket, shooter not on the rifle, mag in, bolt back, the bucket will be upside down. So the bucket was specifically upside down. You didn't have any options on uh, which side the bucket was on, or if you turn it on side, you know, whatever. Uh, it had to be uh, upside down. On the start signal, shooter will engage the 1 inch and 0.75, yard, or 0.75 inch targets at 35 yards from the bucket. Shooter will then move to a supported prone position and engage the 2 inch and 2.5 inch at 100 yards. Shooter will then move to the bucket for a one round each at the 1 inch and 0.75 inch at 35 yards. Shooter will then move to a supported prone position, engage the 2 inch and 2.5 inch at 100 yards with one round each. Shooter will then move to the bucket for one round each at the 1 and the 0.75 inch at 35 yards. Uh, so this one, you're shooting prone, moving to the bucket, shooting off the bucket, moving to the prone. So you're bouncing back and forth between the two. Um, again, not supremely difficult. However, um, I, I was, again, having some issues with that 100-yard target and not understanding why. Uh, and so I only got about half of my shots connected. And uh, looking this over, uh, most of them, I, it appears... Uh, we're connecting at the uh, 
at the closer range. I did get a couple of the 100 yard shots, um, but most of them I was getting at the, uh, the closer range. So there's not a ton of strategy on this. Again, I used um, the mini fortune cookie. I used it upside down. Uh, with the rifle uh, between the ears here, and that allowed me to get uh, pretty stable on the bucket. Uh, basically support the rifle just above uh, where the mini fortune cookie was and have the rest of the rifle hanging off uh, the back of the bucket. Uh, very light pressure on the cheek and on the butt. And uh, it was able to get stable pretty quick. Um, the T1X, I'll comment really quickly, has a very, very smooth bolt, uh, so it is really not difficult to cycle the bolt very fast. Um, I added a little bit of weight to the trigger from the last time I shot the T1X in a match, and uh, that prevented me from having any issues uh, with dropping the striker when I slammed the bolt forward, so I was able to run it very fast and very smoothly. Um, moving back and forth between the bucket and the prone, um, there, the key is to have as little wasted movement as possible. So when it's time to go prone, as soon as you break that second shot, you don't need to see where it went. You don't need to see what happened. You don't need to inspect the targets. As soon as you break that second shot, bolt back, come off the bucket, drop to prone, get squared away on your prone. I uh, grab the bag as soon as I come off the bucket and come prone. I grabbed the, the uh, mini fortune cookie and threw it behind the buttstock and supported the rear of the rifle with it. I uh, got settled in, got my parallax dialed back to where I needed to be and started breaking shots. Uh, same thing there. As soon as you fire the last shot in the prone, you immediately come up, grab the rear bag, throw it on top of the bucket, uh, drop the gun in it and get set up and get your shots off. Um, back and forth is not that bad. I will generally, instead of trying to do a seated position or anything, I will just do a double kneeling. Uh, that for me is uh, the quickest position to get into on the bucket. Um, seated would be more stable, but double kneeling with the center of the gun supported with a heavy rig like this uh, is more than stable enough uh, to get that little target. Um, on this stage. So 0.75 inch at 35 yards is the smallest target we had to shoot on this. That's a pretty big target for 35 yards. Um, now, a couple of key things that you need to get beforehand. You need to know what your dope on the rifle is at 35. Most of us will zero these at 50. Uh, so that means you are still going to have a little bit of a holdover at 35. It's probably only a couple of tenths, uh, but you will have a holdover at 35. Uh, for me, I usually just favor a little bit high on the target, and uh, that is sufficient uh, since the range is so close. Again, didn't worry about dialing. I just held off in the reticle and worried about managing the parallax turret. So as I said, I came off of that um, with 50 points, so half of the allotted. Again, not super happy with it, uh, but the uh, the issue with the 100 yards with misses at the 100 was really messing with me. I only missed a couple of shots off the bucket, uh, so most of my misses uh, appear to be at the longer range. Uh, the big thing there is once you move from the prone to the bucket, make sure the gun's settled before you try to break shots. Um, don't still try to get into position and break your shots. You have two minutes. Two minutes is a ton of time. Uh, so get stable before you start shooting. And our next post is called Severson's Scariest Stage. Um, the targets were 35 yards, 4 inch on a single hanger, 35 yards, a 0.5 and a 0.25 on a KOIL rack, and 50 yards, a 1.5 and a 1 inch on a double hanger. Uh, 10 points per impact, 100 points possible, and equipment was one bag approximately the size of a volleyball or, or smaller and sling. So this is a positional. Um, the start position is port arms, mag in, bolt back. Uh, the start position, shooter will take a kneeling position and engage the, I'm sorry, on the start, shooter will take a kneeling position and engage the 35-yard 4-inch target with two shots. Shooter will then take a supported position and engage the 0.5 and 0.25 targets at 35 yards with two shots each. 
Shooter will then move to the seat of the chair and engage the 1.5 and 1 inch target at 50 yards with two rounds each. For the kneeling position, the only equipment allowed is a sling. Uh, so you couldn't go kneeling and use the chair as support. Uh, once you went to kneeling, it was uh, sling only or no sling if you felt like it. Again, uh, because this one we were moving to different positions, I didn't want to be hampered by getting in and out of the sling. Uh, mainly because I have not practiced um, utilizing the TAB PRS sling quickly like that. Uh, it is totally possible to do so the way the adjustments are on it. I could slack it out really quickly if I wanted to and have uh, really no tension on it. Uh, but then we have to maneuver the rifle to get it in underneath the uh, back of the chair onto the seat. And I just didn't want to have to deal with it at the match. That's probably something that I'm going to practice in my off time. So we talked about the kneeling position and the strategy on this is first getting that stable kneeling position. So as soon as you start, you need to get into the kneeling position uh, and you need to get stable. So get that low kneeling, get dialed in, make sure your wobble area is on target and start breaking your shots. Uh, so two shots from the kneeling, as soon as you break that second shot, bolt back, stand up, start moving. Uh, then you need to get into the prone position. So you're not gonna stand up, you're gonna immediately drop down into the prone position and this is supported prone. So since it's supported prone, uh, you do have the bipod and you may use a rear bag. Uh, so I did drop down into that bipod and rear bag. Um, that was two shots each at the 0.5 and 0.25. And I screwed this one up. Uh, so we are so used to on the KYL racks, engaging one target and then engaging the next that I couldn't wrap my brain around that. Uh, so I dropped two points there because I did not um, re-engage before moving to the next target. So you had to shoot one target twice and then shoot the next target twice. Uh, it wasn't one, two, one, two. Um, so again, attention to detail. That one got me a little bit. Um, then once you got your four shots... In the prone, you move to the seat of the chair and engage the 1.5 and 1 inch target with two rounds each. Uh, again, you engage each target twice before moving on to the next target. Um, this one um, took a little bit of planning ahead of time. Um, I did not do well enough planning ahead of time and it cost me at least one shot. Uh, so with the bipod on here, I was using the worn bipod on this, uh, which has a uh, thumb knob on the side of it, uh, or a handle on the side of it. I don't know what you want to call it. It is a podlock type knob, uh, clockable lever. So I knew that I was going to need to get it off quick. So I didn't have it torqued down super tight. I had it just tight enough to hold it where I wanted it on the fore end. Uh, so when it was time to move, I just simply uh, flipped the knob, jettisoned the bipod, and then I was able to turn the rifle sideways and thread it between the seat and the back. Initially, I had intended to use uh, the WeBad bag uh, on the seat and then get the rifle on it, uh, but I was worried that I wasn't going to have enough elevation to get the scope uh, underneath it, and I was going to put pressure on the scope, so I jettisoned the bag. Um, Probably should not have done that because after I looked at the video afterwards, I did have enough room uh, to get the bag underneath the forend and still have enough room between the seat and this portion of the scope. It wouldn't have had enough up here at the bell. So if I had the rifle too far back, it would not have fit. Uh, but up here by the ring, it would have fit. Uh, so I should have gone ahead and did that. Uh, since I didn't, though, what I had is hard on hard and slick on slick. So I have this nice uh, anodized surface here, or uh, Cerakoted surface here, uh, sitting right on a painted metal chair with the rain coming down. Uh, so it was slick as snot. Uh, the first shot I connected, no problem. Um, they called my time. I was starting to concentrate on how much time I had left. And right as I started to press off the next shot, I felt the rifle slide. I actually felt the trigger twist underneath my finger as I broke the shot. And the rifle slid off target as I broke the shot. 
Uh, so the fore end, just really no grip at all. I may actually, going forward now, I may see if I can get some uh, grip tape and uh, put some of the uh, rubber granulized grip tape like uh, Talon Grips makes on here. I want to see if I can get that on and then still be able to slide an Arca rail back and forth on here. Uh, one of the lower profile uh, skid pad type deals probably would have worked a little bit better than hard on hard uh, but in the future i just need to take the extra couple of seconds to set up with the bag and then i wouldn't have had that sliding issue and overall it would have been great but on the flip side of that without the bag i actually ended up being low enough that i could get my elbows on the ground and so it gave me extra points of contact and it was very stable at the rear that's why i may look at doing the grip tape uh, just to get low enough on the uh, seat of that chair. Now, the disadvantage is our chair sits on uh, bare ground, so there are times when the angles of the chair may be strange, and if the, if the front of the chair is lower, so if the chair is facing downhill, so if the legs get down into a hole, um, then it's not as bad because you have a flat surface at the back that you can get back here towards the fulcrum of the rifle or towards the balance point of the rifle. Uh, but if the chair is going uphill, so if the back legs are too low, uh, then the front seat of that is going to be higher and you're going to hit the rifle up here. And that is not going to be good for balancing the gun out and actually staying on target. Uh, so that's where running the bag or running a skid pad back here where you have a little bit of extra uh, height towards the magwell on the rifle is going to balance things out a little bit better. So again, this is, uh, this is really only the second match that I've run with this rig. Um, I've run it a couple of training days. And every time I run a match, I find something new that I have to throw in on my training days. Uh, to be able to get this guy dialed in exactly where I need it. Uh, hopefully I will stop changing equipment and I will stick with this rig throughout the year and uh, I will be able to get it exactly where I want to get it. It's one of the benefits of um, running one rig for an entire season. Uh, it is also one of the drawbacks of testing gear all the time because I'll get something new and shiny in and I want to go try it at a match and then uh, it kind of uh, goofs me up a little bit. Uh, but so far I've been pretty happy with this. Uh, I came away from that with 70 points, uh, so only dropped three shots on it. Um, wasn't too terrible, but again, I didn't have any of those uh, pesky 100-yard targets to deal with that were throwing me off. Uh, and then finally, we had the Boo Barrel stage, and this was our paper stage. Uh, so uh, the rain tapered off just a little bit, but we still had to put paper targets out on a cardboard backer in the rain and it was not uh, the greatest. We had to make sure we got through it quickly uh, before the targets actually uh, started falling off of the backer. I ended up putting quite a few staples in the targets to give us the greatest possibility of keeping them up, uh, but the better solution would have been to go out with some packing tape and actually uh, tape the targets to the cardboard backer with packing tape. Since the NRL 22 targets are just printed out on uh, regular printer paper, um, printing them on cardstock would have given us a little bit better time of um, keeping the targets up, which I'll keep in mind probably for our next uh, rainy match, uh, but also taking packing tape and either uh, covering the targets in packing tape or taping the targets or even using um, some kind of clear um, report cover or something of that nature. Uh, you can get those at Office Depot stores. Uh, putting the targets in that probably would have held them together for a little while longer, but this worked out just fine for us. We were able to keep the targets together long enough uh, to shoot them and then immediately bring them back in and score them. A covered target position would have been ideal, but we just didn't have that. So the boo barrel stage, again, 120 seconds, 10 round count. A 50-yard, 2-inch NRL 22 paper target. And the points on the target are 10 points for center hit, then 8, then 6, or 4, and of course, 0 for a miss. Equipment is one bag that's the size of a volleyball or smaller. 
The start position is rifle grounded, standing behind the rifle, mag in, bolt back. The 55 gallon barrel will be positioned so it would roll towards the targets. Uh, so you had it horizontally in front of you so it would roll forward or back. However, you could use um, rocks or cinder blocks or something uh, to prevent the barrel from rolling away. Uh, you didn't have to do that on the clock, you could do that in the setup. The shooter will go prone on the left side of the barrel and engage the top target with three shots. Shooter will then move to the 55 gallon barrel and engage the second target with two rounds and the third target with two rounds. Shooter will then take a prone position on the right side of the barrel and engage the bottom target with three rounds. Sandbags, rocks, etc., may be used to keep the barrel from rolling. Uh, so again, prone, although you could use a uh, bipod on this one. Uh, then you can move to the barrel itself, shoot two shots on the second from the top target, then two shots on the third from the top target, and then you move prone to the right side of the barrel and uh, shoot your three shots on the last target. Again, fairly straightforward uh, for this. I use the bipod on the front. I use the mini fortune cookie as a rear bag. And as soon as it was time, I picked the bag up, uh, dropped it on the barrel, and I used the little legs so that one was towards the front of the barrel, one was towards the back of the barrel, and then the gun across the top of it like this. Uh, it gave me a nice uh, stable position to where I could still adjust the elevation of the gun. Uh, but once I got where I wanted and loaded it down it stayed put and uh, that allowed me to put a minimum of pressure on the buttstock to keep the barrel from moving forward and back uh, that worked pretty well i was able to get some uh, really good shots off even on top of the barrel uh, the prone shots were not a problem at all this rifle was shooting very very well and that's why the 100 yard misses were just really baffling me um, i got uh, quite a few um, center punches on the target and uh, did pretty decent on that. So I came away with a total of 88 points. Uh, you guys have been watching for a while know I absolutely hate paper stages. For some reason, I never do well on paper stages. So uh, this one was a little bit of a surprise. Uh, I actually think I had the top score uh, for our group on this stage. So uh, that one worked uh, pretty well. And that was the end of the stage. So some considerations for shooting in the rain that we have to think about. Uh, one is what I mentioned at the beginning is rain really affects the shooter more than it affects equipment. Uh, rain has the tendency to make us crawl inside of ourselves, especially when it is a cold, rainy day and we don't pay attention to things as closely as we should. So you really need to double check everything uh, when you're going through your firing process. You need to double check to make sure that your turrets are zeroed out when you come off a stage so you don't start the next stage uh, with your turrets dialed. You need to make sure you're adjusting that parallax for NRL 22. Parallax is not something that I worry about massively when I'm shooting a center fire match. So NRL 22, I really have to pay attention to that parallax. Uh, when I'm running on the higher magnification levels, parallax is more critical. Uh, when you back the magnification down, you can get away with a little bit less parallax adjustment, but when you're bouncing from 35 to 100, it's still critical. Uh, so you need to remember to adjust that. And don't be tempted just to go, oh, I can see the target well enough. I'm just going to aim for the middle of the blur, because every time I've tried to do that, um, it's turned around and bit me. Uh, for equipment... You want to make sure that you're running fairly robust equipment. Uh, Bolt-action rifles don't have as much problem in the rain as semi-autos. Uh, if you're running a semi-automatic rifle, a 10-22, etc., make sure that you have actually shot it in the rain prior to taking it to a match in the rain. Uh, you want to be able to know what issues you're going to have with it. Um, optics. Most optics out there nowadays are uh, nitrogen-purged. So they are relatively water resistant to begin with. Now, that's not to say that all scopes, especially when we're working in the less expensive price ranges, are waterproof. That's not the case. So if you go submerging them, you may have problems, but we're not shooting at the bottom of a lake. We're shooting in the rain. So water's going to hit them and run off. 
Uh, the shape of modern turrets allows water to run down them instead of pool in them, uh, so that's not a problem. But you do not want to set the rifle in a situation where water can collect in anything. So depending upon your range, if you have rifle racks, then make sure that water cannot pool in the objective or in the ocular of your scope. You don't want water to be all pool up in there and then start to work its way past uh, those seals. Additionally, your barrel, you really don't want to allow water to run in the barrel. So be careful if you do muzzle up. Uh, of course, you have to abide by your range of safety rules, but if possible, when you're in the start position, uh, tilt the rifle muzzle down so that you don't have water running into your barrel before you chamber that first round and go to town. Optics, there are different problems depending upon the coatings on your optics. Um, I will find myself, uh, as soon as I finish a stage, I will usually close my caps, but if I can put the rifle under cover um, and wait before the next stage, I will open my caps back up and try to allow most of that moisture to escape. Uh, depending upon the temperature, you may find that if you close your scope caps between stages, your lenses may fog. Uh, it may have the ability for the inside of the caps, especially if you have intermittent where you have sun and rain, sun and rain, uh, for the inside to heat up and that to steam up and get fog. Um, the Bushnell Forged work great. The, the hydrophobic coatings on the lenses in here were just fine. I didn't have any fogging problems at all during the match. But you also want to make sure that you're not breathing on the eyepiece. Uh, you start breathing on the eyepiece, it can fog up really quickly. And if you do that on the clock, uh, you may lose a ton of time waiting for it to unfog. If you go up there and wipe it with your dirty little finger, uh, you're going to cause greater problems and it's not going to defog. You're going to have smears and all kinds of other stuff. So be careful of that. Uh, lastly on optics, um, I've got a sunshade on here. Uh, sunshades, I rarely ever actually am using a uh, sunshade for the sun. I like sunshades in the rain because unless you have rain coming down hard, it keeps the rain off your ocular or your objective lens. Uh, so a sunshade is a great thing to use in the rain. Again, you just need to make sure that your rifle is never pointed upwards so that it does not fill with water. Because that much water, a couple of inches of water sitting in here, uh, could be enough pressure to force water past the seals and the lens and then cause you greater problems later on. If you lay your rifle down on the bench, uh, make sure you're not laying it so that water can collect in the cup of the turret and start working its way past seals there. That's just a longevity issue. Uh, you should have O-ring sealing your turrets, but um, there are still the possibility of problems there. Um, the greater issues are water getting down between the receiver and the actual uh, chassis or the bedding if you're running a traditional fiberglass stock. If you're running a wood stock, some of the guys running uh, base class rifles in NRL 22 may be shooting wood. Uh, wood can swell and do weird things uh, when it gets wet, when it's exposed to uh, moisture. Uh, so you may find point of impact shifting if you're not using a fiberglass and pillar bedded rifle in a wood stock. Uh, so just keep that in mind. If you're using a chassis system, the chassis designer should have accounted for that, and there shouldn't be anywhere for water to really collect in the chassis. You may get a thin film of water between the action and the chassis, but it's probably not going to make a huge difference uh, with a 22 rifle. Uh, the ACC chassis uh, really did a good job of managing that. I didn't notice any problems. Again, we're going to go back out and see if we can run down that, that 100 yard issue. Uh, but I don't think it's because of the chassis. My bet is that it is probably because of the condition of the bore up here at the front, because as I shot deeper into the stage, it seemed to alleviate itself. So again, we'll see there. The uh, rest of the conditions are really just what you have to do with your equipment after. After the match is over, you don't want to leave your equipment in the bag. You want to immediately get it out as soon as you get home, Start breaking things down. Uh, take the action out of the chassis. Blow everything out with compressed air. Wipe it down. Uh, the Tika T1X is not coated. It is still uh, the 
factory finish on it, which I believe is a blued or parkerized finish. Uh, it looks like it is a blued finish on here. Thankfully, we didn't really have any rusting issues out in the field. I had a little bit of rust spot or two develop on the bolt release, but they are quickly managed with a little bit of oil and a rag. Um, so the rest of the rifle was fine. If you are running a Cerakoted rifle, you really shouldn't have any issue with corrosion where that Cerakote is intact. Uh, stainless rifles, again, you probably won't have much issue with corrosion, but if you're running a blued steel rifle, you want to be ahead of that, and you want to make sure you get it dried out and wiped down as quickly as possible. Uh, make sure you take the action out of the chassis. Uh, if water can get down in there, rust can develop, and it will be a huge nasty mess if you start getting rust between your chassis and your action. That may cause all kinds of issues down the road. And really importantly is your trigger. You want to make sure that you get some air blown through there, blow any water out of it. Uh, lighter fluid is a great way to flush out any moisture from the trigger. And lighter fluid, uh, specifically Zippo, uh, because it doesn't have the some of the gummy additives some of the other stuff has, uh, Zippo lighter fluid will uh, really go through, push that water out, and then it'll evaporate and leave a very, very light level of lubrication left in there. Uh, that was an old trick back in the day for Remington 700 triggers, the old factory uh, 40X triggers, and the um, Walker triggers. Uh, you wanted to get a light coat of lubrication in there, but you couldn't actually put oil in it because then it would gather dust and grit and cause all kinds of issues that the old Remington 700 triggers are famous for. So flush out your trigger, that way you don't have any problems with anything rusting or anything collecting in there. Then bolt everything back together, torque it to spec, and you're good as far as the rifle. The big thing is the scope. Um, so after a rainy match, make sure that you leave those scope caps open when you get back to the shop. Leave the rifle out. I like to leave it out for about a day uh, with my scope caps open. And that makes sure that the coatings on the lenses have time to dry out. Uh, those hydrophobic coatings do a great job of keeping water from collecting on there. Um, but if you get moisture in those seals and you get moisture in there and you close these up, your scope can start to develop fungus. Uh, once fungus starts growing in an optic, it's absolutely horrible. It will really affect the clarity of the scope and is very difficult to get rid of. Uh, so you want to leave those caps open, uh, let it air out, let those coatings dry, and that again, if you get any water in there around those seals, will allow that to dry out as well. Uh, there's not much you can do for the absolute interior of the scope. If it's a high quality scope, you should still have a nitrogen purge in the scope. No water should have been able to actually make its way in as long as you're doing the right things. Uh, if you do end up with moisture actually inside the scope, don't try to take anything apart. You just need to contact the scope manufacturer uh, because there's not a lot you're going to be able to do without special tools to get in there and remove the moisture from inside the scope itself. Depending upon your scope model, you may want to take your uh, turret caps off uh, and let that air out. Um, if you decide to use compressed air to blow anything out, um, be very gentle with it. You don't want to use high pressure compressed air really close to lenses or really close to seals because you can actually blow air past those seals uh, depending upon how you're doing it. And again, uh, you don't want to get that air inside the scope. You want to have a pristine environment inside the scope itself. Um, bore is totally up to you on how you want to handle it. Uh, generally, if you put the gun away, as soon as you're done firing and the rifle is hot and you put it away, the inside of the bore is going to stay relatively dry. Um, if you are not, if it has to sit out in a rack and it cools, uh, then you have, may have moisture condensed inside the barrel, so you're going to at least want to run some dry patches through. Um, if you run an oily patch through, you want to make sure you run dry patches through so that the bore is dry after that. Uh, Rimfire rifles generally like to have a seasoned bore, so if you're worried about it and if you do clean the bore of your rifle, you're probably going to fire some foulers before you go out and shoot the next match. Uh, so hopefully you're going to have some training days in between matches uh, that you can foul the bore back out. But 
Cleaning the bore is not 100% necessary, uh, but for peace of mind, you may want to at least throw a dry patch through it to make sure that there is no water collecting in there and that you won't get any rust in the bore later on. Um, care of the inside of the bore of your rifle is such a personal preference thing, it's not even funny. The safe bet, if you want to be absolutely safe, then push a couple of oily patches through it push a couple of dry patches through it, and then that will displace any moisture inside of it. Um, try to resist going nuts and spraying a bunch of stuff down the bore because it generally is not necessary. So that is it on the overall care of the rifle uh, post-firing in a wet and nasty match. Uh, thankfully, didn't have any problems with the Tika and the ACC. It cleaned up great. I didn't have any problems at all with the Bushnell Forge. Uh, so I really definitely want to thank MDT for sending us the chassis and Bushnell for sending the forge out. So far, this setup has worked great. Uh, additionally, um, I want to point something out. Uh, Stark Shooting down in Australia sent us their swept ball bolt handle for the Tika. I have fallen in love with this thing. I've always liked the bolt handle on my Accuracy International, and it has this uh, round, swept back type feel to it. Uh, I just keep finding more and more working with it on 60 degree bolt lifts like we have here on the Tika. It is just so, so fast, and it feels so good in the hand uh, when you are working with the bolt handle. And Sterk really did a novel design with this, the way it mounts up on the side of the Tika. It's really elegant, it works great. I did have it loosen up just a little bit, so I did during the uh, post-firing inspection here go through, pull the bolt handle back off, and uh, apply Loctite again to those fasteners and torque them down. Uh, so hopefully we won't have any problems with it loosening up in the future. But because of their design, it wasn't able to spin off. It just uh, jiggled a little bit, and so I had to go back in and uh, tighten it back up. Uh, so overall, everything on the rifle worked beautifully. Um, I'm looking forward to getting it out on a training day and uh, shooting it again and seeing if we can uh, line out this 100-yard uh, issue, and I will definitely come back and let you guys know what I find about that. All right, so now I'm going to take a minute and talk about this guy here. Um, as I mentioned before, this is the Wee Bad Mini Fortune Cookie, and for this match, I decided to use it as my only support bag for the entire match. Uh, and there's a couple of reasons for that. First of all, because WeBad is a sponsor of the NRL 22, I wanted to uh, get to know the product a little bit so I could advise guys that either wanted to buy one or not. Um, and also because uh, the NRL 22 has been debating, I shouldn't say the NRL 22, shooters in the NRL 22 have been debating on if NRL 22 is becoming a gear race uh, like centerfire competition has become. Um, and so I kind of wanted to limit myself to what I was using. There's nothing in the rules, especially in open class, that says I have to use one bag for all stages. Uh, the rules just say that the stage requires either one bag the size of a volleyball or smaller or no bag. But in the interest of advising newer shooters to this, I really wanted to be able to say, hey, you can buy this one and use it for everything, or no, it wasn't suited for it. So what I found, and this is a little bit specific to the rig that I'm shooting here, but I've also found it true with base class rifles, is you can use this as a foreign support bag, as a rear bag, as a lot of different options, and it works fairly well. Uh, now, the whole deal with using it on the chair, eh, that's going to be kind of specific to the rifle that you're using, how tall your scope is mounted, and exactly how you have that set up. Uh, but with the exception of running on the seat of the chair underneath the chair back, um, this bag gets it done on a lot of the different setups. Uh, it works okay on the rungs of the ladder, although a lower profile bag very often works better on the rungs of the ladder. Uh, but it works great on the back of the chair, works great on barrels, and I found that it works pretty decent on the tank trap. Uh, so really, I've been pretty impressed uh, with the Wee Bag Mini Fortune Cookie, and obviously it is compliant with the NRL 22 rules because it is listed out in their course of fire. Uh, so I'm definitely happy with this, and I'll 
put a link to it uh, down below. Uh, so if you guys like it, uh, you know where to go pick one up. Um, but I think I'm going to continue to use it. Um, the It compares very well to the Reezer uh, Pint Size Game Changer. Uh, the Pint Size Game Changer is probably going to remain my favorite bag overall. I like how the top of it is flatter uh, than you get on the mini, mini fortune cookie. Uh, but the functionality between the two is very similar. Uh, the wax canvas and the leather handle on the pint size game changer is just kind of cool. Uh, it's a little bit heavier, I think, than the mini fortune cookie, although they're they're really kind of close uh, as far as that's concerned. But uh, it's a pretty cool piece of equipment. It is made here in the U.S., um, and they are a sponsor of the NRL 22. So make sure you check that out. And that's going to do it for this episode of Mail Call Mondays. I hope you guys have enjoyed it. If you have any questions over anything we've covered, please leave it in the comments section down below or send it to us on Facebook or Twitter. If you guys would like to know how to support the content that you've grown to know and love, uh, please check us out over on Patreon. We would love to have you as one of our Patreon subscribers. And again, it helps us to have the resources to continue to make these videos. So thank you very much for that. And until next time, get out and shoot.